greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a privilege to come here and share God's word. A few weeks back, uh, Pastor TB had started a series. Uh, it was about walking with the Lord, serving God, and then he went and said that we need to govern and rule. So that is uh, something I'm going to be touching on today, that as we walk with the Lord each day and we decide to serve him, the Lord enables us to govern and rule. We are called to govern and rule. Just tell your neighbor, you are called to govern and rule. Do you believe it? I'm called to govern and rule. Let's start with a word of prayer. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for what we have been learning these weeks. You've taught us that we need to walk with you, walk in obedience, and we need to start serving in whatever capacity we can. And Lord Jesus, at this time, Lord, enable us to understand what it means to govern and rule. Holy Spirit, I just pray over everyone here that the, you will open their hearts, and even those who are watching online, you will open their hearts to the word, the word that is life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you because you love to teach us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we are called to govern and rule. In fact, in Genesis 1, verse 26, uh, God says that I've made God a man in my image and I've given them dominion over the fish and over, the, uh, over all the animals on the earth. So that was his first plan, to give man dominion over the earth. But then we know as Adam and Eve, they sinned, that dominion that God had given, given them was taken away from them and give, taken over by Satan. And that was a sad picture. And from that time onwards, the children born, they were under the kingdom of darkness. But in the fullness of time, Jesus comes. And Jesus came to, to do something so beautiful, to die for us, and he was resurrected for us. And when we accept him as our savior, we are just snatched out of that kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. Just imagine that. Just think of yourself. If we hadn't known this news, we would have still been there. But God in his mercy just took us up and brought us into the kingdom of light. And then not to just be orphans, but to be sons and gods and, and daughters in his kingdom. Romans chapter 5 verse 17 says, For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life. Come and tell me. Say it out loud. Reign in life. Let's reign in life. So one man's sin, because of one man's sin, we were led to death. But because of a non, another man's obedience, we, and because of his gift of abundance of grace and righteousness, we will reign in life. So the Lord's purpose is that we reign with him. Yeah. So I was just looking at the word of God, and I was just thinking, okay, govern and rule. What would that mean to each one of us? And thinking about it. And I just realized that the first area we need to rule is to rule ourselves, rule our lives before you start ruling anyone else. Proverbs chapter 25 verse 28 says, Whoever has no rule over his spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Just imagine that phrase. I just love that verse. If you cannot rule over your spirit, you're like a city without walls. And you know if you go through the city, the compounds without walls, there'll be so much garbage. It's such a mess. But if it has a good wall, the, it's safe. So just imagine in, your, in our lives, when we don't have those walls, because we don't rule over our spirit, everything that is terrible in the world is just thrown into our lives. And so we need to learn to rule ourselves first. In the letter to Colossians, Paul uh, writes... And he, in the first two chapters, he establishes that Jesus is the image of God and he created all things and by him all things were made and also he reconciled all things to God. And then he goes on to say, we were buried with him, which is symbolized by baptism, and raised with him in faith. So we didn't just, he didn't just take us up and keep us someone here. He raised us up 
to a higher position. And Colossians 3 verse, it's in that context that in chapter 3 verse 1 he says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Even in the book of Ephesians, we read that how Christ has, has raised us up from here into the presence of the Lord. So we are seated in the presence of the Father. So that is where we reign from. So just imagine if you, after being born again, have continued to have the mindset of an orphan. You, you have incredible riches in Christ, but you cannot you know, receive it because of the mind that you have. So he's saying that, first of all, understand where you are seated. You are seated in the presence of our Lord and Savior. Yeah? And from that position, we reign. And, uh, and he continues to say, as you reign, there are areas you need to deal with. And in chapter 3, verses five, verse 5, it says, therefore, so you are seated there, but you need to understand something. You have to put to death your members which are on earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So all these sins against our body and also covetousness. How many of you have felt covetous about someone else's nice dress or nice car? Or, you know, it's so natural for us to want something that we don't have. But here it's saying that covetousness is idolatry. And the Lord is saying, guard yourself from that. Because it can start with something small and end up to be something really big. You'd start coveting little things, and after some time, you just can't control it. So I was just, uh, you know, thinking about recently we had a problem in our home. I mean, uh, our compound. Uh, so there was a small dog, and that started getting into our home, uh, into our compound area. And every day, it, it would bite the newspaper into pieces. So in the morning when we come out, it's a mess. It'll go and, you know, mess up everything here and there. And we're wondering, the gate's closed. Uh, you know, everything is uh, there. What can we do? It's a small dog. Then we realize, okay, we have to find out where there are holes in there, where are areas where this small dog could get in. And so we saw that below one of our side gates, there's a, it's a, little, there's a little gap. And this dog managed to get in through that. Every day, faithfully eating our newspaper. Yeah? So we then immediately, my husband went on, uh, you know, troubleshooting, and he went and put the two big stones underneath, and after that, the problem was solved. And later on, we were just discussing with someone, and uh, they were saying that, yeah, that this one small dog that used to come into your area, I said, yeah, it's disappeared. Uh, they said, now it's too big to get inside. <laughs> so just imagine, so even in our life, there are areas which are, you know, there's small areas of trouble, you know, nagging, uh, covetousness, or jealousy, whatever it is. When it's small, kill it. And then you won't have to struggle with it. Otherwise, it will come in greater problems. Yeah? So I think, you know, when you rule yourself, you have to deal with these areas. At the very first thought, if a thought comes that is not from God, settle it. Deal with it and rule over it. Yeah? And uh, verse 8 says, but now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. So the previous section, there were, those were big sins, according to us, I think. And these are little, little things. We can live with it. How many of you got angry last week with your loved ones or someone suddenly? Yeah, someone which was very faithful <laughs> and such. And so some people are very honest about it. Yeah, even I got angry. And sometimes I pray, especially when I'm coming to give a message, Lord, let me not get angry for anything. <laughs> yeah, you don't spoil the mood. But anger, anger is something you have to deal with. You have to rule over it. Because uh, it can, it's some, one area where the Lord is asking us, be careful, don't be angry for anything. And also he said about the tongue. See, the tongue in James, it's written that the tongue is such a small thing. It's like in a ship, uh, the, 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 such a big ship is steered around by the small rudder. The same way the tongue steers the course of your life. And so, each one of you, be careful of what you say. Especially parents, be careful what you say about your kids. He's lazy. No, no, no. Don't say that. Take it back. Just bless them. It may be so. But you know, the Lord doesn't say that of any of us. 
when the lord saw gideon he didn't say you're fearful he said you're a mighty warrior so start speaking uh, things that will benefit your children because what we say really affects in the spirit realm you won't realize it what you say will affect your children so be careful about how you you know speak about others so your tongue is something you need to take rule of so we learn to rule over ourselves and then in verse 12 and 13 he says therefore as the elect of god holy and beloved put on tender mercies kindness humility meekness long suffering bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another even as christ forgave you so you also must do so take off all these things and put on love put on humility put on kindness every morning you have to remind yourself because the natural thing is to just uh, put all those things off but the lord says put these things on so i know as we were sharing about how you need to walk with the lord and many of you have started serving and when you serve there are going to be problems this person said this that person said that and there'll be issues but what does the word of god say walk in love forgive so even as a church family in whatever team you are in do not dishonor the others walk in love you know uh, that is what the lord has asked us and thus we can take rule of yourself as you serve alongside others so that is about ruling yourself then i was thinking about governing and ruling in our sphere of influence so what are some things that we should keep in mind as we govern and rule in our uh, our field of influence the first thing you, we need to understand is god is the highest authority are you sure about that yes god is the highest authority and he is the source of all authority and every other authority is delegated tell yourself now just speak loudly every the authority that i have is delegated and if you understand that you will never lord it over anyone else the authority each one of us has is delegated uh colossians chapter 2 verses 9 to 10 says for in him dwells all the fullness of the godhead bodily and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power so jesus is the head of everything yeah and the authority we have is delegated you see in the uh, in the bible how when when before jesus was crucified pilate tells him do you not know that i have the authority to leave you or imprison you and jesus turns to him and says you would have no authority at all if it had not been given to you from above so we need to realize that he was he was so uh, you know crucial in the role of jesus crucifixion but jesus knew so clearly that that authority was given by the father so every everything that give is given to us is from the father it's delegated that's the first thing we need to realize as we govern and rule in our area of influence the second thing is we need to have a godly order in different areas of our life okay you see in the godhead there is order cuz the father god the father there god the father god the son and god the holy spirit god is one but they have different roles god the father would probably plan things and decide this is to be done while god the son jesus is the word and he speaks things to being while the holy spirit does it what a beautiful harmony and we see in creation how all this happens god said it i mean god decided it jesus was the word with him spoke it and the holy spirit hovered over what they were doing and even when jesus came god the father decided okay someone has to go and save the people and jesus says i'll go and he came and then after coming he went back and he's let the holy spirit come on each one of us what a beauty in that order and that is the type of order that god wants us to follow yeah so now where do we need godly order first of all uh, in our families in a family the father is the king priest and prophet of the home and the mother influences like the holy spirit yeah we are equal but god has given us different roles and both parents are to shepherd the children guiding them into god's perfect will yeah 
So that should be the role that we play as parents, that uh, we should guide them into God's will. So we are so worried about them achieving so much in the world, uh, doing this. They have to be the best in everything. But we sometimes forget that the most important thing is that our children should be in God's perfect will. And I think as parents, we need to be stewards in such a way that we guide them into God's purpose. I encourage all you parents that even when your kids have exams, send them for junior church. Give them that importance. Don't, you know, uh, don't say that, okay, there's no time for family prayer. They have to study. You have, don't compromise there. When you compromise here, later on when the children make their own choices, they will choose the world first and the church and your, their personal faith later. Second, so we need to set that standard. There needs to be godly order. Even in the decisions that we make as a family, the husband and wife, we should decide things in such a way that, okay, sometimes we don't agree with, about everything. The husband and wife will not agree about everything. But we bring it before the Lord. And so the children will see, oh, our parents honor the Lord. And the Lord's decision is the most important. And so in every decision, when we give the Lord the first place, then there's a godly order in the family. So I remember even when I was, when the Lord spoke to us uh, to, to come to, to join this church, uh, it was a time where my children were going to uh, an, a nominal ch another church where uh, as a family we were going and uh, they were in the Sunday school there. But we sensed very clearly that, yes, we have to come, we have to get out and we have to look for another church. And at that time, uh, my son said, Mama, why do you want to do that? You, we can go in the evenings and morning we can be at our old church. Then I just told him, Mune, we have to obey the Lord. This is a decision that both of us, we've prayed about it, and this is what the Lord has decided. And within a few weeks, my son came and said, I'm so happy you took this decision. So, but the thing is, we were not sure where the Lord was leading us. But we were just praying about it and asking the Lord at every step, Lord, your will be done. So your children should know that you give God the first preference in every situation so that they will take those decisions accordingly. So first, godly order in your home, in the family. And even in way, when we take decisions as a husband and wife, if my husband decides something, I'll just submit to that and I'll pray about it. And I'll ask the Lord, Lord, if this is your will, let it happen. If not, just show him. In every situation I do that because the Lord has given us that order where we as wives will submit to the husband, but the husband honors the wife. What a beautiful order, yeah? And the next thing is godly governance in the church, yeah? Jesus ascended on high and gave gifts on man. This is written in Ephesians. So Jesus gave the gifts of, of the fivefold ministry to us, to the church, so in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 14, it says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some are prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. So Jesus gave the fivefold ministry to us. There are apostles, there are prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the governing of the church, for the godly order to be there in the church. So who are the apostles? The apostles are the sent ones. They are commissioned by the king. So that word apostolos means sent one. It was used originally in, in Greek, in, even in Rome, where the Romans were sent to make new, smaller kingdoms. They'd, they'd probably go from the main empire and go to other areas. So an apostle, apostolos, was sent to establish something similar to the, orig, the home kingdom. The same way an apostle is someone sent from the kingdom of God into another area to establish God's kingdom there also. So that's the work of the apostle. And secondly, the prophets, the office of the prophet. So many prophesy, but not everyone is a prophet. So we can all, you know, at some point prophesy. But the office of the prophet is such that the prophets and the apostles, they work together and they steer the church in the direction of the vision or the, the plan that God has for the church. And that is their role in the governance of the church. And next we have evangelists. Are we all called to share the gospel? Yes, every one of us are. But all of us are not evangelists. 
this, this office of the evangelist is a person who is equipping others to share the gospel. But all of us are called to share the gospel. So there are evangelists. And then there are pastors and teachers. Pastor is a shepherd, the shepherd of the house, the shepherd of the church and the teachers, some who have a special grace to teach God's word. So if all this, God has given a grace. So he has given this the five positions to govern the church. And some people say, oh, the fivefold ministry was there in the early church, but it's not here now. It's not active now. But in that verse, it says, if you continue to read, till, so the fivefold, the pastors are there. For the, well, why are they there? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So these people are positioned in the church to equip the saints and to edify the body of Christ. Come on, join with me and say, what are the fivefold ministry for? To equip the saints and edify the body of Christ. So it's there for building up the church. And till when? Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. Okay? So uh, have we reached that perfection? No. So till that perfection comes, these five positions are held in the church. Yeah? And so, so that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. So they're positioned there to teach you to know the word of God and to not be pushed aside, tossed and turned with every teaching, that you be strong in the word of God and you will be able to discern from right from wrong. And that is a big responsibility. Each time I come here and share, I, I say the Lord, Lord, from my mouth, let there not be any word that is against your doctrine, your word. It is with the fear of the Lord that I come here because that is a responsibility that is given here. So that is a fivefold ministry. And here we see that it's not for dominating or controlling others, but the authority is for the benefit of others to speak the right things and set them in order. Okay? So there is the fivefold ministry in the church, and there is also a group of serving people, the deacons or the leaders, various leaders in the church to bring order. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 1 says, Paul and Timothy, born servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. So he's addressing all those who are serving in various posts of leadership. Uh, okay, though this letter is to you. And deacon, that word is diakonos, the Greek word, which means uh, a minister or servant of the king. What a beautiful phrase. Diakonos is servant of the king. So here you see a lot of people serving. You have the ushers. You have people helping in parking. They are servants of the king. We have the worship team. They are servants of the king. I'm a servant of the king. So when you, you know, uh, when they ask you to do something, probably parking, usually we get irritated. We've parked somewhere and we don't want to, you know, budge from there. But if someone tells you, there's a problem here, could you shift the car this side? Just remember, remind yourself. This is a servant of the king. Let me listen to that person and oblige. So that should be the culture we have as a church and when others are serving to remember that they are servants of the king. So that is diakonos. And John chapter 12 verse 26, it says, If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. Oh, beautiful. If, you, if any of you serves God, just follow him. And where Jesus is, he, you will be. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Oh, and I read that verse, I was thinking, my, what a privilege to serve God. If anyone serves him, he will honor you. You may not you know, receive all the rewards here. Everyone's not going to appreciate you every week for ushering. Or, you know, leading in some, some of the teams. But the Lord will honor you. Remember that. So you're doing it for the Lord. Yeah? So we need to have godly order as we govern and rule in our areas of influence. Thirdly, we have called to servant leadership. 
in uh, Mark's gospel, chapter 10, Jesus is talking about his death and crucifixion, how they, he's going to be handed over to the Gentiles and he's going to die and he's going to be resurrected. And after, and, and after that, James and John immediately run to him and say, uh, teacher, can you, uh, can you give us what we ask? This is like a child, no? Asking the parent, Papa, can you give me what I ask? It may be something very difficult to give. But the same way, James and John childishly go to him and say, can you give us what we ask? And Jesus says, what do you want? And they say, we want to sit at the right and left side of you in, the, in glory. And then he says, that is something that the Father decides. And I just imagine how all the disciples would probably, you know, fighting amongst themselves. I want to be the first. I want to be the first. I want this. And what does Jesus reply to them in verse 42 to 45 of chapter 10? But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. So the world system is where we be, sometimes leaders lord it over others. But Jesus said that's not the way it should be here. No? Uh, but whoever desires to become great among you, shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. What a beautiful way that Jesus modeled for us. He served. He said, the Son of Man came to serve and not to be served. Let that be our ideas. Come on, let's make a decision right now. I've come to church to serve. Not to be served. Just tell the Lord right now. I want you all to make a declaration. I'm coming. I'm going to be a part of church uh, to this, just so that I can serve, and not always to be served. Yeah. And uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said uh, a beautiful statement. He said, "Everyone can be great. Everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve." You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve for all the English teachers. You don't have to make your subject and verb to, to uh, agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love. And that is all you need to serve. So if any of you is a bit fearful about, okay, I don't have any gifts, I can't serve. No, the word of God says, you all of us can serve. We just have to do whatever we can. The little thing that you do, is important here in our family, yeah? So we have Jesus model for us servant leadership. Fourthly, we need to lead with vision. So do you, does anyone know the vision of the church? You can say it loud if you know it. Church, the whole church transforming the whole world for Christ's eternal kingdom. So if you don't know it, just note it. And remind yourself, yeah, this is something that we are going to move towards. So what does that mean? The whole church transforming the whole world for Christ's eternal kingdom. That's a big vision, but it starts here. How can we transform our areas? We can go out, show the love of Christ, and share the gospel. It's just like the Great Commission. Just imagine, just 12 disciples turned the world upside down because they had a vision that God, Jesus said, go and make disciples. Same way, if there's so many, about 100 plus people here, if you all decide to, to, you know, to carry this vision, it will go out into the world and we'll be able to transform them. So you need a vision, not only as a church, but even your family. Where are you taking your family? Where does your family fit in the picture? What is our role as a family? Each of us has different roles as families. The Lord may have called one family to serve, one family to just love on the body of Christ. So one, uh, one family to have, be compassionate about the poor. Whatever it is, ask the Lord what your calling is as an individual, as a family, and in the church. Yeah? So we need to lead with vision. Ask the Lord. And he will surely show you. Next, you need to lead with passion. Yeah? If you don't have passion, you know no one's going to follow you. If you don't have passion, your children will be more absorbed in their things. They say, that's more exciting. But if they see you run in passion, they will follow. So Nehemiah was a man of passion. So he had a burden, which is actually none of his business. But he said, no, this is something I need to take up. And he says, I'm going to build the wall. 
And he just went out. He could have probably said, I'm not equipped. I'm not a contractor. I don't know anything about building walls. But the Lord gave him this burden and he said, okay, I'm going to do it. And because of his passion, in 52 days, the, the wall was built. So you need passion as you lead. And uh, so Matthew 11 verse 12 says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Come on, we want some people who are violent in their faith. Violent in their passion for the things of the Lord. Where it comes to the point where the Lord's purpose should be fulfilled. Whatever comes your way, it's not going to stop me. I'm going to do God's will. Because finally, we're going to be judged according to that. Did we fulfill that purpose? So let that be our passion. And sixthly, we need to rule through prayer. Revelation chapter 1 verse 6 says about how Jesus died for us and it goes on to say because of what he did because of his blood and has he has made us kings and priests to his God and father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen come on tell your neighbor you're a king and priest that's very sad come on louder you're a king and priest you're a king and priest you're a king and priest yeah so how, what does a priest do? A priest is the one who, who stands in the gap. He ministers to God and he stands in the gap for, between God and man. And so how can a priest be a king? It is through prayer. When you rule through prayer, you, you become the king and priest that God wants you to. You know, we cannot solve so many things. Sometimes I think, okay, I'm leading a few departments here in church and I can't control everything. You know, I would love to, to make everything work smoothly. But the Lord said, no, you can't do it. So sometimes I think, Lord, uh, you've given me that responsibility. How do I manage all that? And then the Lord says, just look at me. So, and I leave it to the Lord's feet. And I pray. And I said, Lord, this is the area. There's a mess here. Please solve it. And believe it or not, within a day or two, someone else comes with a solution. You know, you're not the solution for everything. God can work as we pray to solve many the situations and we rule. So who won? We won together because the problem was solved. But how was it? Not by my trying to do everything, but my ruling in prayer. Everything I do, I think because the Lord uh, took me out of my, uh, as a do uh, from my work earlier which as an ophthalmologist, the one thing he said is, Kavita, I want you to lead prayer. And that is what he took me out. And I said, Lord, couldn't anyone else do it? But he said, no, you come out and lead the prayer. And that training has helped me realize that from prayer, everything, due to, through prayer, everything is possible. Everything, everything is possible. So whatever the Lord puts on me, I'm, it's from prayer. I wake up in the morning and say, Lord, these are the things. I give it to you. You do it. Yeah, and the Lord does it. So prayer is a mighty way for us to rule. And the next thing is, we need to understand authority. You know, this, all of us are familiar with the story of the centurion in Matthew chapter 8, where the centurion's servant uh, is sick, and he comes to Jesus for the healing. And then he comes to the Lord and says in verse 8 and 9, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word, and my servant will be healed. For I also... I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And Jesus marveled at his revelation because this man understood authority. This man knew that Jesus had such authority, he didn't have to come. I, mean, I don't think anyone else in the world has said that. But he said, you don't have to, you have, you don't have to come. You just say the word because I understand authority. I understand there are people above me, there are people below me. I know the system works like this. The same way we need to understand authority. We have people above us, we have people below us. And it has to work. Things have to work in a godly order. So we need to understand that authority. So I was just uh, reminded when we started the prayer here, initially we just pray for the church and little th different things. We pray for the city. But as we kept 
kept on praying. I believe that mighty things started happening in the spirit realm. So in fact, when we first started praying, uh, one or two of our, the guest speakers, they came and they said, you should rise in intercession. Two years later, one of the speakers came and said, I see open heavens here. I see there's so much prayer that has happened here that you have, you have risen as a church in your authority over the land. So just imagine, you have to understand that God has given us this land, but we rise in authority as we pray, as we obey, as we preach the gospel in the land. So we need to understand that. And we have areas of jurisdiction. I can't take... Uh, authority over another area that someone else has. I can't, I can't, I, if I go and pray in another land, uh, what, I, what I would do is probably call the leaders of that place and we would pray in agreement because they have that jurisdiction here. But then the Lord has probably sent me to partner with them, to strengthen them and to agree with them and something happens there. So you need to understand your authority when you govern and rule in your area of influence. And finally, not least, but not least, be Christ-like. As we govern and serve, we need to be Christ-like. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 says, Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. In your home, your children should say, My dad, he's so Christ-like. My mom, she's so Christ-like. I think that is the greatest legacy we can leave them. That people would say, Oh, that leader... She's so Christ-like. Let that be the legacy that we have. So I was just, I'll just go through those points. So when we, we know, first of all, we need to know how to rule ourselves. We have to rule. The God will make us responsible. We are responsible for ourselves, first of all. Secondly, we need to govern and rule in the areas of our influence. And so when we govern, what do we have to understand? There are some things we need to understand. That God has given us this authority. And there is a godly order about how things are done in every situation, in your family, in the church, in every situation. Because even Jesus, he'd say about giving taxes, go, give that. There is a godly order. And then thirdly, that Jesus models servant leadership, and we have to do the same. Fourthly, lead with vision, lead with passion. Then we need to remember that we need to rule through prayer. Seventhly, we need to understand the authority God has given us. And finally, but not least, we need to be Christ-like in everything we do. And that is the way we need to rise up as we govern and rule. So as you walk with the Lord and you, as you serve, God will give you more responsibilities. Be faithful. Follow the rules of the kingdom, not the rules of the world. And then we look at the key verse for which this series was started Zechariah chapter 3. So Zechariah chapter 3 is a scene where Joshua the high priest, he, is, uh, he was a priest during the time of Zechariah. And Zechariah sees a vision. And in that vision, he sees Joshua the high priest standing in the presence of the angel of the Lord and then Satan coming and accusing him. Joshua at that time has filthy rags all over, on him. So Joshua actually was, a, according to history, was a good man. But probably the priests under him were involved in wrong things. And so it was, he was seen in the spirit realm as someone with filthy clothes. And then Satan has that chance of accusing. And immediately God rebukes him and says, I rebuke you, Satan. I rebuke you, Satan. And then the Lord tells the angel, go and tell Joshua to take this advice. And we see in verse 7, the Lord of armies says, this is a verse to Joshua, says this, if you walk in my ways and perform my service, then you will both govern my house and be in charge of my courtyards, and I will grant you free access among these who are standing here. Oh, what a beautiful verse. So the Lord is telling each one of you here and those in your homes, if you walk in God's ways and perform his service, then you will both govern his house and be in charge of what he has given you. And then what will happen? He will grant you free access into his presence. 
the more and more we serve, the more and more we walk in his ways, we will get access to his presence. Just imagine what a beautiful reward. I think Moses desired that more than anything, that he would know this God and serve him and be in his presence. My prayer for us as a church, as the ecclesia rises, that we will not only walk with the Lord and obey, but we will serve him faithfully and we will govern and rule in his house faithfully and the Lord will say come into my presence young child come into my presence <coughs> let's pray let's pray hallelujah Lord this is a word from you this is your word and I pray right now you have spoken to many you have convicted many first of all we need to rule our lives there, I think there's some areas where some of you are struggling. I don't know what it is. It may be with your tongue. It may be anger. It may be some lust, whatever it is. We are humans and the Lord is merciful. Just bring it to the Lord. The Lord will help you to rule over that area. The Lord will help you to be victorious over that area. Ask the Lord, Lord, help me. Help me in this area. Probably you, you don't have a good relationship with your spouse. The Lord is saying, I will bring godly order into your home. I will bring, just let me. You come before me. You give, you surrender this area and I will reign over it. Let the Lord rule in your home. Probably your children are not growing up the way you want them to. And they've walked away from the Lord. The Lord is saying, don't worry. Just bring them to me. Pray, pray. I will touch them. I will change them. You just keep praying. Keep praying. He is faithful. He is faithful. So Lord, I just commit everyone here. Even as some of you, the Lord is telling you to rise up in serving. Take it up. Take it up. Take it up and tell the leaders. In the, you can tell in the help desk, I want to serve. I want to volunteer. Because only when you serve can God give you that authority to govern and rule. And each of us needs to grow in this area. So I pray, Father Lord, that many more will serve, that we will not be a church that just looks and sits and comes every Sunday, but everyone will serve, either here or outside, wherever it is, wherever it is. Lord, give us that grace. And I pray that we will govern and rule according to your will, that we will arise. We will truly be the ecclesia of this land. We will truly be the ecclesia governing and ruling our, our neighborhoods, governing and ruling our city, governing and ruling our nation. Abba Father, give us that grace, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to each one of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.